In the mid-1900s, the discipline of long-distance American motorcycling was growing in popularity. With the rapid growth of the American highway system and the improving technology in motorcycles, riders were demanding a machine that could travel further and faster. After Indian motorcycles went into bankruptcy in 1953, it was up to the only remaining American brand to push the sport forward. Harley-Davidson would develop their Duo Glide on their touring chassis platform that would give riders both front and rear suspension. But this wasn't enough. Riders needed more comfort and more storage. In an effort to make their motorcycles even more comfortable and user-friendly, they developed the electric starter. The Electroglide was first introduced in 1965, but this still wasn't enough. Riders demanded more storage and more wind protection. In 1966, the Vetter Fairing Company would be founded by Craig Vetter, who would develop fairings for the Electroglide and Duo Glide. Aftermarket companies like Wixom and Vetter were scrambling to develop more wind protection solutions and more luggage solutions like saddlebags and tour packs. Today, Craig is considered to be one of the pioneers in bolt-up fairings in the motorcycle industry. Craig went on to develop windjammer fairings for a lot of the major motorcycle manufacturers like Honda, BMW, and even Harley-Davidson with their Liberator fairing. Harley-Davidson customers were purchasing fairings and saddlebags to outfit their duo glides and electro glides to be more properly equipped for high-speed, long-distance highway traveling out on the road for multi-day trips. In 1969, Harley-Davidson came out with their Electroglide with a factory fairing for the first time. This factory fairing Electroglide was a big moment in Harley-Davidson's history. So big that in 2021, Harley-Davidson would come out with a new line of motorcycles called the Icons Collection, where this bike would be celebrated in their Electroglide Revival motorcycle. This batwing shaped fairing on Harley-Davidson's motorcycles would set the standard for the most recognizable style in American motorcycling history. The batwing fared Electroglides would go on to be the benchmark in the Grand American Touring Market. As time went on and Harley-Davidson dominated the touring motorcycle industry, many other brands would try to develop their own knockoff version of the batwing fairing to take a piece of the American cruiser market. In the early 2000s, the Batwing fairing touring machines were finding a new identity. Riders in the early 2000s wanted a touring chassis motorcycle with the wind deflection benefits of the Batwing fairing, but without the grandpa styling of a full dresser touring bike. So they started modifying their Electroglides, taking off the tour pack, changing out seats, lowering the motorcycles, taking off lights. Harley-Davidson took note of this new trend or these customized baggers that a lot of their riders were building. In 2006, Harley-Davidson came out with their first factory bagger, so to speak. It was a touring chassis motorcycle with the Batwing fairing. More stylized wheels, lowered suspension, reduced tail lighting in the rear with just two bullet turn signals. They eliminated the lollipop turn signals in the front, chopped and smoked the windshield, put a lower profile seat on the bike, attached the mirrors to the inner fairing, took away the electric lights passing lamps for just one solo headlamp. After about a half a century of building motorcycles for the sole purpose of utilitarian touring, Harley-Davidson decided to make their touring bikes cool for the first time. They decided to make a bagger. Instead of creating a whole new nameplate and model designation, Harley-Davidson decided to go back to a time in its history when they created a customized Electroglide, a very unique and limited edition FLHX at the end of its shovelhead era in 1984. It was very suiting to apply this name that was only prior used for a factory custom bagger. In 2006, they decided to bring back the Street Glide. Hey, what's up guys? Matt here coming to you from Laidlaw's Harley-Davidson. So I'm going to go over with you the newly redesigned 2024 model year Street Glide. So I'm going to talk you guys through everything I have learned thus far about this brand new touring chassis or American touring motorcycle. There are some really big changes in the 24 model year. If you want to know more of the details in more of a macro standpoint and how this bike falls in the total lineup of the 24 model year, then check out the video I'm going to link here in the upper right hand corner. But the 24 model year will mark the 18th year in a row that the Street Glide has been continuously in production, like I mentioned before. It was in production for I think one or two years back in the 1984 model year. But the Street Glide has been one of Harley Davidson's bread and butter motorcycles for a very long time now. So I'm going to break this video up into different categories. Feel free to use the bookmarks down below to get to the section that you're looking for, or just sit back and
and take it all in because I'm going to be going into detail on everything you really need to know about this 24 model year Street Glide. So first off, let's talk about the biggest, most noticeable thing about the 24 model year, and that is the Street Glide has been completely redesigned in terms of body style. So this body style was first introduced in the 23 model year on the CVO Street Glide. The CVO Street Glide was kind of a big preview for what we were gonna see the very next year on all of the Street Glides in the 24 model year. So pretty much all of the body components have been changed on this bike. I think with the exception of the rear fender, it does have the same frame still. So the frame that is being used on this touring chassis motorcycle is the one that was introduced in 2009. But the tank has been completely redesigned. It is still a six gallon fuel tank. The fairing has changed in a big way visually. You've got almost like this square shaped headlamp in the front. The turn signals are on these bars across the front of the fairing, almost like the wings of an eagle. The windshield has like the this floating effect on it. It's definitely been modernized in a big way. This is probably the biggest visual change we've seen on the Batwing fairing since it was first introduced in 1969, like I mentioned in my history portion of the video. It has the brand new saddlebags as well. The saddlebags have a little bit more room even when compared to the stretch saddlebag. You've got these arching lines that follow all the way through the fuel tank down and continue on the saddlebags as well. The saddlebags have a little bit more of a rounded outer shell look to them. And in the back, they've got this cut back towards the front of the bike, which I like as well. You still got very similar latches that open up on the inside, kind of by the back rear seat there. New front fender, it's a little bit smaller, a little bit more sporty. Personally, I like the new body style. I think it was a necessary change. And although I didn't think the old body styles were completely out of date, the more I look at this body style and then look back at the old body style, I realized that it was time for a change. The body style on the Road Glide was also changed. And really the only difference between those two are the fairings. The rest of the body work is the same, like the tank and the saddlebags is really the same. They're shared between the Road Glide and the Street Glide. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the Road Glide in a different video though. But at night when you see this thing behind you coming down the road, the lighting and everything, the silhouette of the motorcycle, Cycle looks really really sharp. You've got a new wheel design on these bikes as well. It's a 19 inch wheel in the front, 18 inch wheel in the rear. They're cast aluminum wheels. Right now these wheels don't have like an official name to them but we'll just call them the 24 model year road glide or street glide wheel. And for those of you who don't know already this street glide is just a regular street glide FLHX. This bike is taking the place of all three street glides last year namely the street glide standard, the street glide special, and the street glide ST. So those three bikes are now just replaced with one single street glide. The seat has also changed this year. The seat had the padding and the cushioning inside it changed out and the bucket shape of the seat was changed a little bit as well. And this is one of those things that I immediately just kind of glazed over and said, okay, whatever, they changed the seat a little bit. But really, they enhanced the comfort of the seat in a big way this year. It was one of the things that after three, four hours on this motorcycle, I noticed, especially as a tall rider, I feel like they really improved the ergonomics for tall riders. And that's not to say they compromised the ergonomics for short riders. One of the things they did with the redesign as well was they dropped 18 pounds off the weight of the Street Glide, which is not a big number when you're considering this is about an 830 pound motorcycle. And honestly, it felt like more than 18 pounds to me. And I'm not sure if that's just because of where they reduce the weight. They reduce weight in like the fuel tank. They reduced most of the weight in like the triple trees, so the steering column. And so maybe that's because that's a moving part. You move with your hands because the weight was dropped so dramatically there. Maybe it's a little bit more noticeable a weight decrease. I'm not sure exactly, but the bike does feel significantly lighter. So the body style is one of those things where it's a little bit subjective and whether it's better, whether you like it more than the old body style or you like it less than the old body style. I think one thing that can't be argued is the fact that it does have a more modern appeal. It is updated. You don't have the turn signals off the front and the back of the bike as like an add-on. It's all integrated into the bodywork now. The lines are a little bit more angular now. The mounting of the windshield just looks a lot cleaner than the old one where you're basically just putting screws right into the bodywork of the fairing. You can't see any of that anymore. It's like a floating windshield so it looks better. The fuel tank has a gas cap that just lifts up and doesn't screw off which is nice because you know you're never going to lose it at the gas station. You no longer have those standard rubber hand grips that we've seen for so many years on Harley Davidson's. They're a little bit more of like a waffle style design on there now. So speaking of new fairings, the other really big immediately noticeable change
change on the Street Glide this year is the infotainment system. So they've increased the viewable area by about 90% on these things. It's now a 12.3 inch TFT screen on here. So the screen pretty much takes up all the real estate on the inner fairing now. It's eliminated the analog gauges that we saw on the previous model year Street Glides. And I'll admit, I'm kind of an analog guy. I like the speedometer, I like the tachometer. I feel like the older I get, the more I become like this crusty old biker. I'm not quite there yet, but I am slowly but surely turning into your stereotypical Harley riding biker guy. Hopefully I can have an objective point of view for a few more years though. So even though I was a little bit reluctant to be super accepting of the new electronic gauges, now that I've ridden the bike, I've kind of been converted over. The gauges are a lot easier to read. They're a lot bigger now. You have three different layouts or three different modes that you can choose from. You can do a cruising mode, a touring mode, or a sport mode. They give you a little bit different layout of your home screen and your gauges. The cruising mode is probably my favorite. we have just got a really big speedometer and tachometer with a screen in the middle for either your navigation or your media. The touring screen pretty much moves all your gauges to the left and then gives you a huge viewable area for your navigation, which is really nice to have if you want the biggest possible viewing area if you're trying to navigate on a road trip. And then the sport gauge just gives you a really big gauge right in the center with your tachometer, the largest it can be, and your speedometer right in the middle for a quick glance of how fast you're going. The infotainment system is completely different now. It's got the Skyline operating system. So if you're used to the Boom Audio GTS system, you're going to have to relearn a whole new system with this thing, which at first I was kind of just frustrated navigating everything. But once I spent a day on the bike, I was able to navigate the system pretty dang easily. And I do like the new operating system. I do like the new infotainment system. It looks really good. It's really easy to read, very high contrast. It has two different modes. It has like the black background that has the high contrast mode as well, where it turns white and you can see the text and lettering in the bright daylight a lot better. The bike does have Bluetooth connectivity. It's also got Apple CarPlay. It does not have Android Auto. Android Auto is not available on motorcycles anymore. That was an Android decision, not a Harley Davidson decision, by the way. So I was able to take a test ride through the Valley of Fire with a lot of the Harley Davidson staff, which was a huge honor to be out there with a bunch of other YouTubers and journalists and things like that. But I was able to pair my phone easily, stream music via Bluetooth with my phone in my pocket. You do have the option of this drawer that slides out with the push of a button right underneath the infotainment system. This time around, Harley Davidson made a storage compartment for your phone that could actually hold a phone. The old Rushmore fairing, which was the previous generation fairing, had a cubby hole for a phone, which unfortunately really couldn't fit a phone. So with this new drawer style compartment, I fit my iPhone 15 in here, no problem. It does have a USB cable in there as well, so you can charge up your phone. And if for whatever reason you don't want to connect it via Bluetooth, you can connect it via the USB cord. But I had full album art as I was listening to music and things like that. You do have Apple CarPlay like I mentioned, and we were able to test this a little bit with Mike on his bike. You do need a headset hooked up to get Apple CarPlay. I can't stress that enough. Apple CarPlay will not work if you do not have a headset hooked up to your motorcycle. The good news is you do not need a WIM or a wireless headset interface module anymore. So the infotainment system comes ready to be paired to your headset right out of the box. Harley Davidson did switch over to the Cardo headsets this year. So the Harley branded headset is a Cardo now. They switched from the Senna. That being said, I believe the Harley Davidson branded Senna headsets will still work. I do not know at this point whether there are any limitations to using a non Harley Davidson branded version of the Senna or Cardo headsets. My recommendation always is if you're going to buy a Harley, you're going to spend the money to get this infotainment system, just get the Harley Davidson branded headset. In the past, there's always just been like these little weird things here and there where you just don't get the full experience unless you get the Harley Davidson branded headset. So if you already have a headset, you know, maybe try pairing it and, and mess around with it. But if you're buying a brand new bike and you need to buy a brand new headset anyways, just get the Harley Davidson branded one. But with Apple CarPlay, you can use navigation off of your phone. All of that works real seamlessly. Speaking of navigation, if you don't want to use navigation off of your cell phone and you just want to use the navigation on your motorcycle, it does require a $350 upgrade to get the Harley Davidson embedded navigation and that has to be done with like a flash at your local dealership. So it's a one time only fee of $350 and then you have navigation on your bike. Again, you don't need that if you want to use the navigation off of your cell phone. I think a lot of people will probably use Apple CarPlay, but at the same time, a lot of people may not want to run the headset, which again would then take away your ability to use Apple CarPlay. You got a couple other features out of the infotainment system that you'd expect
spec, things like a favorites menu where you can get to your favorite audio sources really quick. You got AM, FM radio on here. There is also a subscription service. It's a monthly subscription. I'm not sure exactly how much it is yet. That allows you to get live traffic and weather updates on here as well. The stereo system sounds really good. It's crisp, it's loud. I could hear it when I was doing 65 miles an hour on the bike. Do I feel like it's like light years better than the previous generation Street Glide? No, not really. Is it maybe slightly better? Yeah, maybe. The music I was listening via Bluetooth on my phone sounded really good, and that's all that really mattered to me. While we're on the interfering, I will say that one of the things that bothered me about the bike visually was the interfering. You have a dull interfering on this Street Glide as opposed to like a gloss one that we saw on the Street Glide specials last year. And so the surface area of the interfering just looks a little less quality than the previous model year. And the speaker grills are also plastic, which is something that if I bought one of these, I'd have to change right away. It's like a metal grill like you'd find on a CVO. The inner fairings of the CVOs just look a ton better than the standard Street Glide and Road Glide. And so I have really high standards about fit and finish and Harley Davidson is known for their fit and finish. And I think this is probably the one area of the motorcycle where I felt like the fit and finish was a little bit lacking was the inner fairing. The infotainment system is beautiful. You got wall to wall glass on the infotainment system, no bezels or anything like that. That. So visually, the infotainment system looks really good. So while we're talking about the infotainment system, we might as well talk about the hand controls as well. So the hand controls have gotten a lot busier. And for me, that's not a good thing personally. For me, the simplicity and the design of a Harley Davidson is what makes them beautiful. And now we've just added probably, we've got double the buttons now on the hand controls. So there are some benefits though, as I was working through the controls of the bike. The switch housings are metal by the way, and so they are still premium feel and quality. Benefit to having additional buttons on the hand controls is once you do get used to them, you can do what you need to get done a lot quicker with less menus and, and less button presses. On the old infotainment systems, you had two joysticks that you had to kind of navigate a lot of different menus and dig deep to get to some of the functions of your infotainment system. And while you're on the road, it just took a little bit more time than maybe it should have. And so with these additional buttons, you can navigate quicker with fewer button presses to get to where you need to go. And so for that reason, I think it's a good thing. That being said, when the bike's sitting in the parking lot and you're taking pictures of it, I think the switch housings do look a little bit busy. But functionally, especially with all the electronics on this bike, it is better. They have moved some things around. Cruise control is still on the left-hand side, but it's on top of the switch housings now, which I think is a bad move. I think that's taking a step backwards. I personally liked how the cruise was on the left-hand side where you could use your thumb really easily. Now it's on the top, you gotta use your pointer finger, and I'm sure I'll get used to it. It's kind of like where the Pan America is, which I don't like either. And on the left hand side, you no longer have your seek to the next song or your channel changer or your volume up and down. It's now been moved to the right hand side. So as you're controlling your music, it's on the right hand side and navigating your infotainment system with the arrows is on the left hand side now. So they pretty much reversed that now, which once again, once you get used to it, I think it'll be fine. But for seasoned Harley Davidson riders, the infotainment system and the switches are going to take a little bit of getting used to. I found that after I rode these bikes for a couple days, once you do get used to it, like I said, it's easier to navigate and get what you need to get done a lot quicker than the old infotainment system. Speaking of hand controls, you do have an adjustable brake lever on the right hand side. So that can be adjusted based on the size of the rider's hand. The left side, the clutch side, you do not have an adjustable lever over there. When we asked the engineers why the clutch lever wasn't adjustable, they basically said that the lever is in as close a position as possible to the grip already from the factory. And that any adjustability would just take that lever further away from the grip. So in essence, it's already adjusted to the smallest or shortest range of motion possible to suit what would be the smallest rider hand. And of course, naturally, anybody with big hands is going to be able to operate that clutch just the same as well. Speaking of the clutch, this bike does have a cable clutch as opposed to a hydraulic clutch. Harley Davidson moved away from the hydraulic clutch in the 21 model year, I believe. And in the 21 model year, they went to a cable clutch on all of their touring chassis motorcycles. Personally, I prefer a hydraulic clutch. I just hate the feeling of when the clutch cable goes out of adjustment. This is just me being ultra snobby and ultra picky. I think a lot of people, maybe most people actually prefer a cable clutch. You have a little bit broader friction zone, so it's a little bit more rider friendly with the cable clutch. There's less moving parts, less mechanical complexity, and so it's easier to repair and things like that, less maintenance. But I just like the consistent fluid feel of a hydraulic clutch personally. But that's been the cable clutch now for several years, so no change there. 
I know it sounds like I'm talking about electronics way too much for Harley Davidson, but contrary to popular belief, Harley Davidson does have a lot of technology in these bikes now. So you do have ride modes on these motorcycles now. You have three pre-programmed ride modes, rain, road, and sport, and you have a customizable ride mode for a total of four different ride modes. So these modes are gonna tailor everything from your throttle response, your engine response, your engine braking, your rider aids, and the level of sensitivity they're at, and so the quick in which they'll intervene in a loss of traction situation. So for example, rain mode is gonna have the slowest throttle progressivity. When you roll on the throttle, the RPM is gonna climb a lot slower than say like in sport. And you're gonna have a little bit more sensitive like ABS and traction control as well. Sport mode is pretty much the complete opposite of that. You're gonna have a very twitchy, quick responsive throttle. Traction control and ABS is gonna have a lower sensitivity to them. Engine braking is gonna be a lot more dramatic in the sport mode so when you let off the throttle the engine braking is going to kick in and slow you down quicker without any throttle and then if you go to the custom mode you can pretty much edit all of these different attributes to give yourself a perfectly tailored ride and throttle and ABS traction control experience that you're looking for personally on heavyweight cruisers I've always been a little bit of a skeptic on the ride modes once again I'm turning into the stereotypical crusty Harley Davidson rider slowly but surely I find myself mostly just in road mode but on the test ride I I really wanted to use the different ride modes and get a feel for them and maybe determine what the best use case for the different ride modes were and honestly i feel like there is a good application for these different ride modes i mean rain mode is pretty obvious if you're in the rain it's nice to have especially if you're on a windy road in the middle of nowhere throw the rain mode on there and you're a lot less likely to lose traction coming out of a turn or something like that it takes a little bit of the wrist precision out of the equation if you're on a sketchy road or something like that and if you're in your local canyon you want to do a little bit more spirited riding then sport mode is a really good mode to be able to have going in and out of turns quicker to have that additional engine braking as you're entering a turn and that extra responsiveness as you're coming out of a turn the sport mode is fun to ride with i will say that if i'm just casually riding the motorcycle i don't prefer sport mode the throttle just becomes a little bit twitchier and when i'm trying to favor just smoothness of the ride especially if i have a passenger on the back then i don't want that choppy throttle feel in the sport mode it won't necessarily be choppy if you're constantly concentrating again on your wrist action and your clutching of the bike, but sometimes you're just not in the mood to be riding like that all the time. All right, so now let's talk about what is arguably the most important part of the motorcycle, and that is the engine. So you've got Harley-Davidson's 117 cubic inch Milwaukee 8 on here. The Milwaukee 8 was first introduced in the 2017 model year on all the touring chassis bikes, and then a slightly modified version came out the very next year in the 2018 model year on all the soft tails. So Harley-Davidson is now on its eighth year of the Milwaukee 8 on its touring chassis motorcycles, and this engine has been fleshed out very well. It is a very reliable engine. It's to me, probably the perfect engine for a Harley Davidson. You got the 45 degree V twin air cooled. It is now liquid cooled partially in the heads, which I'll talk about in just a second. But this engine has just the right amount of vibration with being refined over the years. So it's kind of taken some of the vibration out, but there's still enough character in this engine to make people feel like, yeah, I'm still riding a Harley Davidson, which I think is extremely important. You still got the push rod design with the single crank pin. You still got that traditional Harley-Davidson sound that so many people love that really can be amplified with a good set of pipes on this thing. You do not have variable valve timing in here. That's a common question that I get. The reason people ask that is the CVOs in the 23 model year when they were first introduced in this new body style have a 121 cubic inch Milwaukee 8 with variable valve timing. And they do this year as well with the exception of the CVO Road Glide ST. But these 117 cubic inch standard street glide and road glides do not have variable valve timing. Now the things that have changed this year when you compare this 117 to the 117 that we saw on the road glide and street glide ST last year is there is a new intake system. So the intake has been optimized and a little bit more efficient intake on these bikes. So they breathe better and you also have a new water-cooled head system. So last year they introduced this new water-cooled head system on the CVOs. It basically has new water channels that starting with the the rear cylinder first and then pipe that cooled water up into the front cylinder and then circulate it back through the radiator and it starts to loop all over again. So one of the main benefits here is you have less heat radiating up on you as a rider and passenger. 
And this is another one of those things that I kind of just glazed over and didn't really pay much attention to because I felt like, oh, that's pretty subjective. You know, that's not going to really make a big difference. I don't really feel like they're super hot anyways. But after riding these for a full day out in the Las Vegas desert, albeit in the winter time, these engines felt significantly cooler. And I have a ton of seat time on Milwaukee 8 Harley Davidsons. And so I have a pretty good gauge for just how much heat typically comes off of these things. And as long as you're moving, Moving, you're, you're fine but where you really start to feel the heat is when it's really hot outside and you start doing slow speed stuff you're idling at a light or something or you stop your motorcycle after you've reached your destination and maybe you're idling in a parking lot for a minute that's when you're really going to feel the most heat it is definitely noticeably less heat coming up off of these engines so with those couple changes with the improved intake tract and the water cooled heads you've got three percent more horsepower and four percent more torque in this engine and that's when you compare them to the 170 of the ST Street Glide and Road Glide of last year. You can see here you've got a radiator down here below the voltage regulator. There's a fan down there and a water pump as well. On the left hand side you have a little bit of like a water overflow like if the water turns to steam it like overflows up into this little reservoir here which is a little bit of an eyesore. It's not a huge deal it's on the left hand side but it is additional clutter on the bike kind of taking away from the cleanliness of the engine as a whole. A lot of times people ask me you know how reliable are these Milwaukee 8 engines. But overall, the M8 is just a fun, bulletproof engine to have. Availability, parts, and service is really good. Reliability is really good. It delivers the Harley Davidson character and feel that so many people are after. And with a little bit of bump in power this year, it's just a solid engine. Test riding it out on the road, it's a strong running bagger for sure. So now let's talk suspension for a minute. So last year, when Harley Davidson introduced the new body style on the CVOs, they also had a 47 millimeter inverted front and those inverted forks did not make it down to the regular road glide and street glide this model year. So you still have visually the same front ends that you did from last year. However, the front end has been retuned with new internals to match the additional travel in the rear shocks, which brings me to the rear shocks. So the rear suspension, the travel has been increased by 50%. So it is now at three inches of total travel in the tail end. And like I mentioned, the front end has been tuned to match that additional travel in the tail end. I definitely feel felt a difference in the ride comfort. I'm already getting questions and people are saying, okay, well, is it worth upgrading to new suspension? If I changed out the rear shocks, am I going to see an improvement? And I would say, well, that all depends on what type of suspension you put on the bike. Do I feel like there's still aftermarket suspension out there that is going to make this bike feel better and the suspension perform better? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. But I do feel like there are going to be more people that do not feel the need to upgrade suspension and spend the money because the suspension right out of the box from the factory is pretty dang good and I feel like less people will feel the need to change the suspension. Now if you get something that's like a fully adjustable front and rear suspension that complement one another and you get them adjusted to your weight and everything, yeah you're probably going to see an improvement there. Harley-Davidson, they have this fine line and this balance between making a suspension that's going to perform good in, in the turns and everything and also be comfortable out on the road in a straight line with a bunch of different varying weights and everything on there and they all do it without really any adjustability in the front and just preload adjustment in the rear. So it's really hard to make the perfect suspension for every single rider and every type of riding habit out there. So I'll just say it's kind of a good middle of the road suspension and it's definitely an improvement from like your road glide and street glide standard and special of last year. And I feel like it's even a little bit of an improvement from the STs last year as well. And you combine that with a seat that I do feel like is significantly more comfortable even though it has the same form factor. Factor. It's a really low profile, you know, slim down seat. It's a more comfortable seat. So you combine the suspension and the seat and the overall ride comfort is noticeably better on these new baggers. So let's talk about pricing for a minute. And this is probably one of the biggest pieces of news this year. For years, Harley-Davidson prices have just continually gone up. You know, everything is going up right now. Uh, this year, the prices went down significantly on these motorcycles. So you're looking at a base price of $25,995 on these. That's for a billiard gray one with chrome engine trim. Prices on the Street Glide and Road Glide, for that matter, have gone down anywhere between three and four 
$4,000. But when you factor in all the things that they did with the pricing this year, like for example, they took away the $1,000 surcharge. They took away the $1,100 charge for RDRS, which is the Reflex Defensive Rider System, which is now standard on all of these bikes. That's gonna be your traction control, your hill hold mode, and your tire pressure monitoring system. And then they reduced the base price by a couple thousand bucks when you compare them to the specials. And even though they did bump the price a little bit on some of the color options, like for example, you pay $600 if you want the Vivid Black this year, and the engine trim is $1,350 instead of just the $1,000. Even with those couple little upcharges on colors and engine trim, you're still way less than they were last year. So I know a lot of people were complaining about this year, like, oh, you gotta pay for black. Well, yeah, you gotta pay for black, but guess what? You're still saving thousands of dollars because the base price of the bike is way less and you're no longer paying surcharge and you're no longer paying $1,100 for RDRS. So I think the bike that these are probably most comparable to of last year are probably the Road Glide and Street Glide STs, just because the engine size is the same. They have the shorter bags. They have a little bit of the weight savings. They're not completely like an ST. I mean, these aren't really like a race inspired motorcycle, but in my opinion, in terms of value and performance, they're kind of in the same tier. And so it, it's safe to say you're three to $4,000 less this year on a comparable motorcycle from last year. So again, just absolutely huge price price reduction. It's just a huge value this year. You get all the new stuff with the new body style, you know, a little bit of bump and performance in the suspension and the engine, and you get all that stuff for, again, a three to $4,000 less than last year. So now let's jump into parts compatibility. I'm getting a lot of questions. People are asking about like what parts are compatible for the 24 model year, street glide and road glide, and what parts will no longer fit. And so I'm going to jump into just some general areas of the bike that have changed and general areas of the bike that have not changed. So let's talk about the areas in which the old parts for these touring bikes will no longer fit. We'll start off first with the seats. So the seats of old will no longer fit the 24 model year bikes. And even in Harley Davidson's parts, you got to buy a seat that's specifically designed for the 24s, which there are some out there. So I would check that out if you want to change the seat out. So aftermarket companies are going to have to change up their design a bit to fit these new touring bikes moving forward. The next one are the grips. So all the grips that were made for previous generation touring bikes will not fit the 24s. Uh, again, check out Harley Davidson's catalog. They do have some grips that will fit the 24 model year stuff. Windshields, obviously the windshield's completely different. We have a whole new body design. So windshields of old will not fit this bike. Obviously we have a new body style now. So anything having to do with the body will not fit. So that's going to include like a lot of the audio. So your fairing speakers are going to have to be new for the 24 model year. Also saddlebag speakers have to be specifically designed for these new bikes as well. Saddlebag liners will not fit. Obviously, we've got a new saddlebag shape now. So I think those are going to be the big ones for what will not fit. Now, what will still fit, there's kind of a longer list here, which is good for some people. So you still have a Milwaukee 8. So a lot of the stuff on the Milwaukee 8 is going to be still universal fitment. So things like exhaust, mufflers, header pipes, that's all going to bolt up to this bike still the same. I will warn you though, tuning is going to be a little bit different. So engine covers on the M8 are still going to be mostly all the same still. Foot controls are going to be the same fitment, so floorboards, things like that. So foot controls are the same, but hand controls are different on these new 24s. For the shocks, it looks like those are going to be pretty much the same fitment. So suspension that was made for the 23 and older touring bikes should fit these bikes. Clip-on attachments. So things like tour packs, backrests, luggage racks, you know, stuff like that is still going to fit these 24 model year motorcycles. But guys, I can't stress enough to check every individual part on a case-by-case -case basis for your individual model just to make sure that fitment is going to be right for you. But generally speaking, that kind of gives you a rough idea of what has changed and what parts that were made in the past will still fit these 24 model year motorcycles. So here's my final recap and final thoughts, guys. Visually, these bikes are completely different now. And so you have a new body style, which is always kind of one of those things that people jump on when a new body style on anything, car, truck, motorcycle comes out, especially if it's done right. And I feel like Harley Davidson took the time to do this right. It's a nice modern update on a traditional batwing fairing design. You still have the overall silhouette of what has now become an iconic look in Harley Davidson's lineup. You have a more modern, 
electronic suite with the new 12.3 infotainment system. You don't need the whim anymore. You got Apple CarPlay. Yes, if you want the embedded navigation, you're now another $350. So that is one thing that you had to pay for now that you got on the previous generation bikes. You can actually fit a cell phone in the cubby hole this year, which I think is huge. You got cruise standard, which isn't anything new, but you got RDRS standard, which is great. You have a little bit of bump in engine performance. They all have the 117 engine now, 3% more horsepower, 4% more torque. It runs cooler, so a lot more comfortable, especially when you're crossing the desert like we did when we went to Sturgis this last year at 120 degrees. These new water-cooled heads would have been a godsend for a day like that. More comfortable suspension right out of the box, a more comfortable seat. A couple things visually that I don't care for personally, the inner fairing, especially the speaker grills. I think we took a step back in the fit and finish there. There. Switch housing controls, I don't really care for them. I think they're a little bit too busy, but functionally I like them better. So I'm kind of mixed on that whole thing. The water cooling system, although it does cool the engine down a lot more, you're now adding a little bit more clutter to the bike. You have a little bit bigger radiator footprint in the bottom of the down tubes behind the front wheel of the motorcycle. You have a little bit of an overflow reserve on the left-hand side of the bike that's a little bit of an eyesore. There's this weird plastic sensor now on the side of the transmission cover, which I think is just stupid that Harley Davidson did. It basically basically will detect what gear you're in even when you have the clutch pulled in, which I do not think it is anywhere near worth the extra clutter on the side of the transmission for information that most riders should just know intuitively. But the lighting is significantly better. I love the front LED lighting and the new turn signals on the Batwing fairing. They look super sharp. The badging is nice. The tank is super nice. You still got Harley Davidson's Brembo brakes in the front and rear, four piston calipers in the front. The airbox looks decent for a stock bike and it's, it's really optimized to just get the most out of this 117 motor. A custom air cleaner would probably go a long way in terms of looks on the bike. I do like the new wheel design, the contrast cut on here, I think it looks super sharp. It definitely is visually different than any wheel they've done in the past. I love the new floating windshields on here. I guess I should comment too on these new fairings and the wind buffeting. So my head was way above the windshield, this isn't a big enough windshield for my height at six foot six to really do much however I always do like slump down and jump into the rider bubble when I slumped down four or five inches I did get in the rider bubble where the fairing was protecting my head from the wind and it felt good it felt like a nice even smooth stream of air no wind buffeting I know there was a bunch of testing on these fairings just to create the most favorable winds deflection properties and dynamics on here do I feel like it is a lot better than the old fairings in terms of like wind deflection no not really i thought the rushmore fairings were pretty dang good at that as well but if you go back two generations in fairings then yeah these last two fairing generations have been significantly better you don't have the head buffeting that you used to get in the old like late 90s early 2000s fairings but that's about it guys i appreciate you checking out this 2024 model year review of the street glide i'm going to be getting a 2024 model year touring bike this year i'm not really sure which one yet but stay tuned for that i'm going to be putting a lot more miles on these bikes maybe i'll go to a road glide this year guys i don't know i've been riding a street glide now for the last decade and and I've always been kind of a street glide guy, but, uh, and I love this bike. The overall look of the street glide, I still prefer even with this new body style over the road glide. I think the road glide looks good, but I just like how close the screen is and everything to you on the street glide. The road glide, everything's just a little bit further from you and just visually just doesn't feel as familiar as the street glide to me. And I, I, I love the new Batwing fairing on this bike as well. Top speed on these bikes, by the way, is 105 miles per hour where it is electronically governed, so I'm told. I have not taken these bikes up past 100 miles an hour at this point. But if you're looking for a new Harley Davidson in Southern California, hit us up here at Laidlaw's Harley Davidson where we have absolutely no added dealer markup, no dealer fees, no dealer prep, none of that BS. Come see me or my team. We'd love to earn your business. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. We'll see you on the next video. Later. Later.